Okay, time for our next video presentation. Today's concept is linear momentum. Later on in the course, we'll do rotational momentum, uh, angular momentum. But right now, it is linear momentum, moving in a straight line. I'm going to start off the presentation with a question involving a tennis ball and a bowling ball. And the question is, would you rather be hit by the tennis ball or the bowling ball? always interested in the people who say bowling ball at this point. But maybe before you answer, you'd like to know a little bit more about the situation. And remember, it is hypothetical. You're not going to get hit with either one of these things. You're completely safe. But how about if the bowling ball was delivered by this person and the tennis ball was delivered by this person? Well, maybe you're going to change your answer. And I'm always interested in the people who now want to be hit by the tennis ball. It's very interesting. But of course, the idea here is it doesn't just matter about the mass. It also matters how fast the object is moving. And that's what momentum is. Momentum is your mass multiplied by your velocity, those two things. And since inertia is a resistance to change, these two things together tell you about the inertia of something in motion. It's both the mass and the velocity that are resisting the change. Okay. On your AP Physics formula sheet, the formula will look like this. P is the letter they use for momentum and uh, mass, of course, and V, velocity. You will notice above the V and above the P, there are these arrows. And the arrows show that those are vector quantities, that they have a direction to them. So momentum has a direction. Mass doesn't, but mass multiplied by velocity with the direction gives you a vector value of momentum. Okay, so what would you have to change uh, to change momentum? And of course the answer is either the mass or the velocity. Let's talk about the velocity point for a minute here and what would you call that a change in velocity? Well that's acceleration. Well let's go back a little bit further then and say what would it take to cause an acceleration? And, of course, that's a force, so it takes a force to cause an acceleration. All right, and it should make some sense that the longer you supply the force, then the bigger the change in momentum is going to be. So the longer you apply it for has something to do with uh, how big the change in momentum is going to be. Lots of sports involve this concept. In baseball, uh, we're told to swing through the pitch. You know, keep your eye on the ball and swing through. And the idea is you'll be in contact with the ball for a little bit longer. Same goes for golf or tennis or for soccer. It's your foot uh, that's in contact with the ball. But if you swing through, you're going to have a greater change in momentum. Now, impulse is a physics term that talks about those two concepts, force and time, how long you're applying that force for. And actually, impulse is the force multiplied by the time. So there's a value in physics. The force multiplied by the time is called impulse. And it should make some sense that the, uh, the force multiplied by the time is going to have something to do with that change in momentum. The batter swinging at the ball, the longer they're in contact and the greater the force, the bigger the change in momentum. With a big swing and swinging through, you're going to get something like this. That's going to be a big change in momentum. Woo! Hit that ball. All right. So it's impulse that causes the change in momentum. And on your physics formula sheet, it's going to look like this. The change in momentum is equal to the force multiplied by the amount of time it's supplied. So uh, this formula here, although it's new, this term momentum, it does come from Newton's second law, F is equal to ma, and can be derived from it now that we're talking about momentum as being mass multiplied by speed. So here's a challenge question for you. See if you can derive that formula from Newton's second law. Can you show that this is true? All right, that's a quick one for you. Okay, so in baseball, maybe there's a certain amount of force that a batter can apply. You know, they're going to go exercise to increase their force, their muscles, but there's a maximum amount of force, let's say, that can be supplied. So in order to get a bigger change in momentum, they are going to supply that force for a longer period of time. 
Now in some cases, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to uh, minimize the amount of force that an object or a person, or in this case a crash test dummy, feels. And the way you are going to minimize the force is, well, the change in momentum is already determined. You're going to go from a certain speed to zero in a crash. But the amount of force you feel is going to depend on the amount of time it takes for you to come to that rest. So airbags are aware of a way of increasing that amount of time. And it's, it's, a, it's just a short amount of time that an airbag will make you stop. But that short amount of extra time can make a big difference in an accident. And hopefully we never get in any of those, but that's a precaution anyway. Crumple zones on cars are another example of that. So uh, as usual, it's a good idea to be thinking about, here's the concept, how could it be applied? And airbags are a good example of that one. Okay, let's see what else we got going on here. Where do we? I seem to, oops, maybe I click on the screen and then, all right. So here's a problem and the answer is 100 meters per second, apparently. Can you design a problem? All right, that's ridiculous. Uh, here's a problem, and the answer is 100 meters per second. See if you can solve it, and when you come back, you should have an answer of 100 meters per second. And if you're lucky, the answer will do something like this. I gotta see that again. Yeah, I had a little fun with that. Hope you did too. All right, so if you could not get that answer, come back to class and uh, we'll discuss it. All right, here's uh, another concept for you, and that's conservation of momentum. So the idea is if there's two or more objects that are moving or not moving, maybe there's an incident between them, maybe a collision or something. But the idea is the momentum before the in incident will be the same as the momentum afterwards. Little stipulation that it's a closed system, there's no external forces acting. Friction would be an external force. But um, this is a good way of talking about momentum and also uh, maybe doing, well, let me, let me ask you to think about that. How could this be useful? And we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so the recoil of a gun is an example of conservation of momentum. So before the gun is fired, and uh, you know this is true if you've ever fired a gun, there is no momentum. But when the gun is fired, here's a slow motion, you're going to see the recoil, the kickback. And the bullet is going to go flying out one way, but the recoil goes this way. So at the beginning in that example, the gun had no momentum at all. The bullet wasn't moving and the gun wasn't moving either. But afterwards, the bullet is going at a very high speed, but it has a small mass compared to the gun. The gun goes this way. So before the collision, before the gun being fired, there was zero momentum. The bullet in the gun had no momentum at all. And afterwards, well, how does this work out? The bullet's going that way, the gun's going that way. How can there be no momentum? It's the idea of the vectors again. The bullet, let's say, has a positive momentum. The bullet uh, with a smaller mass and its higher speed should have the same momentum as the gun and its heavier mass, its more mass, I should say, going in the other direction. So they should balance out to zero. Here's an example on a larger scale, and this is what they call a Newton's Cradle, and if you ever see one of these things, it's almost impossible to walk by them without giving them a move. Here's one where they've gotten it a little bit larger than the ones that we're maybe used to seeing, but the idea is these balls all have an equal mass. So if one of them goes in one direction, one is going to go out on the other end. And if you are to take a two, then two would go out on the other end or three would make three fly out at the other end. So uh, I think they're about to do the example with three. So three on that end makes three on that end go. So this is a conservation of momentum tool. And it's also a little nice uh, desktop gadget that people seem to enjoy. With a cannon, the cannon has no momentum before it's fired. Afterwards, there'll be the cannonball going one way and the recoil of the cannon itself. And there's the Newton's Cradle uh, as well. Hard to walk by these things if you see them sitting on a desk. Try walking by one without touching it sometime. Okay, here's a little bit more of vocabulary for you. Inelastic collisions are where things stick together after the collision. So there's a little bit of vocabulary for you. And let's see what we got here. 
Um, okay, so in a conservation of momentum for collisions, remember again that the momentum before the collision would be equal to the momentum after. And uh, they use this for accident scenes, right? Now immediately the external force of friction will act, but maybe we can talk about how fast they were going at the moment of impact, backtrack to see how fast one of the vehicles was moving, analyze the scene by the skid marks, and this is commonly done in law enforcement. Okay, so the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. So here's a quick example here of a collision. Uh, see if you can come up with the speed of the uh, 10 kilogram object after the collision. Give it a shot, set it up, see what you come up with, and when you come back, I'll give the answer. How'd you do? The answer is five meters per second. And uh, let's see how you did with that. If you have any questions, bring them on back to class. All right, here's an inelastic example. Two cars crashing into each other. This time they stick together. What is their speed, right? That's an inelastic example. They stick together. And, well, if you come back or if you give it a try, you should come up with 10 meters per second is the answer. Okay, um, here's another one where now we're combining the kinematics, the dynamics. The whole thing is coming together on this one. See how you can do with this one here. And, uh, and see how that works out for you. Okay. And when you come back, the answer I got was 13.8 meters per second. How did you do? All right, here's another momentum problem for you. And uh, this is involving a bullet fired into a stationary block. And let's see. We're going to figure out how fast, uh, or we're going to figure out with some kinematics and some dynamics here what the coefficient of friction is. Give that one a try. When you come back, I'll give the answer. Okay, the answer I got was 0.12. How did you do? If it didn't work out, of course, we can go over it in class. All right, here's another example, a ballistic pendulum. Here again, they fire a bullet into a wooden block, but this time it rises up in the air. They don't have to deal with friction in determining what the speed of the bullet was before it was fired into the block. Now, again, as always, I'd like you to think, why would that be useful? Why would anybody want to do this? Why would they want to know the speed of a bullet? Why did they use this technique? These are some good questions I'd like you to think about. And you know what? Think about as many questions as you can. Don't ever limit it to what I come up with. But here is an example where the bullet becomes embedded in the block of the wood, and it makes the block of wood rise up in the air. All right, so my question here is how high does the pendulum rise? And this ties in now a lot of concepts. Let's see if you can take this one and figure it out. And a little clue is it's going to involve energy considerations as well. So hit pause, see if you can figure that one out. When you come back, I'll give the answer. All right, I got an answer of 0.776 centimeters. How did you do? All right, here is another one, uh, an elastic collision. All right, there's another vocabulary for you. Elastic collision, not only is momentum conserved, but kinetic energy is also conserved. This is not always the case, so they have to tell you it's an elastic collision for that to be true. But in an elastic collision, both are, are uh, conserved, and I'd like you to take this following scenario and show that kinetic energy is conserved as well. Pause, and we'll come back, and I'll give you another problem to think about. Okay, here's another one involving the recoil velocity. Let's see if you can figure that one out. And pause, and we'll come back and give you my answer. Okay, the answer I got was negative 3.5. The bullet is in a positive direction. The recoil is in the negative direction. And, uh, of course, the momentum beforehand was zero, as we discussed before. Okay, here's another one with an elastic collision. This one's a little bit more complicated, but set it up, give it a try, and uh, see what answers you can come up with. Uh, you can pause, and when you come back, I'll tell you what my answer was, see if it worked out for you. All right, welcome back. These are the answers I got. If you didn't get those, we can discuss them in class next time. All right, let's see, here's another one. Now this time, uh, we've got to talk about this idea of the fact that momentum is a vector. 
So what I need to tell you now is that if you have something where there's two dimensions going on with momentum, you're not out of luck. But what happens is, whatever horizontal momentum there was at the beginning, that's the same horizontal momentum as there'll be at the end. And whatever vertical momentum there was at the beginning, or you know maybe north to south, if you will, whatever's going on in that direction, it will also be conserved. So give this one a try with that bit of a hint for you and see if you get the answer that I got. When you come back, I'll give you my answer. Okay, here is my answer, and I hope that worked out for you. If not, as always, we can talk about it in class, and uh, that's about it. That is it for this presentation. I look forward to talking to you when we are back together again. Thank you for tuning in.